Good afternoon, everybody. And um, I think we're asked to introduce ourselves. I won't say a lot because I think uh, what I've been doing will become obvious as I talk. But just to say, my original background is as a composer, particularly of electronic music and computer music, uh, as the computers became used in, uh, in composing. And I'm still doing that when I find time. And from that, uh, so I could do things that I couldn't do otherwise, I started doing some programming, very much self-taught as a programmer. But I've also always had an interest in um, analysis and musicology more generally and finding out how music works. And I've gradually got drawn more and more into that and into the sort of work I'm going to be talking to you about today. And just to echo something that Tim was saying this morning, uh, titles do tend to come at the last minute. This is the title of our new project. And um, again, it was intended to be attention grabbing and rather last minute. And, uh, uh, but uh, quite a lot of thought, I think, went into it as well. So anyway, thanks Tim for, and the other organisers for um, this invitation to, to speak. Uh, I, I think it's a very good opportunity for me as I haven't learned a lot so far about um, the Transforming Musicology Project to, to learn more about that. But I think it's also fantastic this is such a rich gathering of people from inside the project and outside as well. And it's uh, really interesting in the conversations that have been going on so far to, to learn so much um, about all this. And it's also, I think, a good time for me um, to uh, be asked to prepare a talk like this because we're just starting this new project and that means that uh, it's a good time to take stock as it were uh, and also um, uh, to hear ideas from other people and hopefully to start some ongoing conversations about things. So uh, I think the approach I've been developing over a number of years now um, using digital technology in research uh, initially into electroacoustic music and now we're beginning to broaden that out to a wider repertoire it is probably rather different from the approaches uh, that quite a few others have taken to digital musicology but I, I hope these approaches are complementary rather than competition um, and part of a larger broadly defined digital musicology as I say I think the sort of discussions that we've been having hopefully are very useful to, to all of us bringing all this together so my approach has started perhaps not so much from the perspective of um, the typical work on digital humanities, but rather from my own background as a composer in computer music. So bringing the sorts of techniques and algorithms that I, like many others, have employed as a composer uh, to bear on the analysis of music. So it's not primarily about AI, big data, machine learning, MIR or the like, important, those, all, all those, important though all those are, although some of these things might well be important and useful as part of the project. But the primary aim is to use software to enable researchers and their readers, if readers is the right word nowadays, to engage with the music as sound and to do so interactively. So it's not principally about automating analysis, but about developing tools to facilitate creative human interaction with the music. It takes the view of music analysis as a humanistic endeavour, uh, as Dora Hannanen refers to it. It is not just about arriving at an end product, a finished analysis, but also about the human process of ongoing creative interaction with the music. So um, this is an outline of what I'm going to be saying. Since the IRIMAS project is only just beginning, uh, and it does build on past work, I intend to begin by talking about the earlier development of what I've called interactive oral analysis as a response to some of the particular challenges that computer music presents to the analyst. And then I'll give some examples of our previous work taken from the TACEM project before moving on to explain the thinking behind IRIMAS itself and outline the structure of that project. So starting then with the challenge that is posed by electroacoustic uh, music and to begin to give all this a bit more substance I'd like to go back to where I began uh, work in this area it was about 15 years ago now when I was responding to an invitation uh, to contribute analysis of a piece of electroacoustic work to a book that Mary Simone was editing and I faced the challenge of how to go about this although I had been conducting such analyses for myself and with my students for a number of years putting it in writing was quite another matter because electroacoustic repertoire was posing me a number of problems uh, which are perhaps particularly prominent in electroacoustic music more than they are in acoustic music. Let, let me play uh, an example. This is a piece by Jonathan Harvey 
uh, called Mortios Plango Viva. Uh, no, sorry, um, the, the first one I'm going to be playing is from Dennis Smalley's Wind Chimes, a purely electroacoustic piece. <laughs> So here the musical structure is, to a large extent, defined in terms of evolving spectral morphology of the sounds, the way the sounds and the textures are shaped internally in terms of their spectra changing over time. For example, the way certain sounds are repeated with subtle changes to their initial attack transients. Existing language and notation is set up to deal more with notes as the smallest unit of analysis, not with the transformation that happens inside events. And these approaches struggle to represent adequately what is going on in this sort of music. Even if it could, words or purely visual representations perhaps wouldn't convey the essence of what all this means musically. So perhaps a different approach is needed. And let me give you now another example. This is the one by Jonathan Harvey from his Mortuos Plango Viva Spoco. The key feature of this music is the way in which the timbres metamorphose, the voice changing into a bell and vice versa. There is fluidity and ambiguity. What is a note? Or for that matter, what is a timbre? A partial from one timbre may break off and become a separate note in its own right. Notes may merge to become partials of a newly defined timbre. Again, existing notation and terminology and structural models can't really cope with this easily. And the techniques the composer used, both musical techniques and technically, are not widely understood. So that poses further questions. How do you explain technical matters in a way that is meaningful to musicians? How do you link the musical and the technical, as they are very clearly linked in the music itself? And where does the analyst start without fixed identities for notes and timbres? I'll play one further example from River Run by the Canadian composer Barry Truax. And this extract is a little bit longer because it is a music that evolves very slowly over time.
Many of the same points apply in this piece as in the previous examples, but an additional issue is that the music is a continuous process developing without break over a long time span. Segmentation of music into motifs or events, the starting point for much music analysis, isn't really applicable here. It is about processes evolving over several minutes and the, challenge, the changes to the parameters in these processes. So to summarise, the problems posed by electroacoustic music for the analyst include that often there aren't notes in the traditional sense. Transformations happen at a lower level than notes. Instruments, another fixed building block of music traditionally, may not exist as stable entities. Rather, timbres may merge or dissolve. There may not even be discrete events, just ongoing large-scale processes. Traditional notation may be irrelevant because of the sorts of sounds that are used, and standard terminology may not apply easily. The technology and the techniques employed by the composer need to be researched and explained in a manner that is musically meaningful. So where to start an analysis? Rather than try to invent a new terminology or new notation, given that we're in the 21st century, why not use software to engage with the music directly as sound? And this isn't about deriving statistical data from the sound, but encountering the sound orally, temporarily, interacting with it, manipulating it, to learn more about it as part of the research process and to convey this to readers. And again, whenever I say readers, it needs to be in inverted commas, I think. <laughs> Why turn to the verbal and the visual when software allows us to work directly with the sound itself? None of which is to deny that words, diagrams and data can have a useful role to play. It was a result of all these considerations that I started to develop what I have called interactive oral analysis. If you want to know in more detail about this, there is an article in Music Analysis from 2012, which I think is on the screen there, along with some of the earlier analyses that I did, um, looking at two of the works that we just heard. So, to illustrate interactive oral analysis solutions to some of these issues, here are some more recent examples of interactive oral analysis in practice. And these are taken from our recent AHRC-funded TACEM project. TACEM stands for Technology and Creativity in Electroacoustic Music. The project involves myself, Professor Peter Manning from Durham University, and Dr. Frederick Dufour from Huddersfield as the postdoc on the project. And Frederick is uh, here today, and he developed most of the software that you're going to see uh, this afternoon. And I'm glad to say has stayed with us, and he's also working on the new IRIMAS project that we're just starting. So this project was to investigate the interrelation of technology, technological innovation and musical creativity in computer music. And the further development of interactive oral analysis played a big part in this. We're just finalising a book, Inside Computer Music, which, with linked software, is the major outcome from this project. To save time, I'm going to play video demonstrations narrated by Frederic, rather than launching each of the individual software packages separately. I should say that some of the software has developed quite significantly since we uh, made these videos, uh, but I think they still give a good introduction, a concise introduction to the sort of thing that we're doing. So the first example is from our study of John Chowning's work called Stria. This piece, rather like the Barry Truax piece I played earlier, involves slowly evolving processes. In fact, Chowning generated them using SAIL, the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Language. And we've created a graphical emulation of this algorithm so that our readers can play with the parameters, see how they are used to shape the musical passage, and instantly hear the results. And that's something that John Chowning himself couldn't do at the time he wrote this piece. He had to wait several hours for the results of his computations to generate sound. So here I'm going to play a video now to uh, show this software in action. <coughs> Another explorer gives access to the algorithm Chowning used to generate sets of elements called events. Each event has timing parameters. frequency-related parameters, parameters related to the timbre, and to the spatialization. You can investigate presets corresponding to all the events of Stria 
but you can also explore the algorithm further beyond the work itself to evaluate its musical potential. So this is recreating the piece um, in real time, done with the help of information and guidance from the composer himself, but with the additional potential that you can actually change the parameters that made the music and therefore change the piece and learn more intimately about those processes and what they mean musically by doing so. The second example is from our study of Trevor Wishart's work in Margot. Rather like the example I played from Dennis Smalley's Wind Chimes, this piece is built from many subtle sound transformations. In this case, starting from just one single sound source, the clinking together of two whiskey glasses. This um, part of the software allows readers to follow these transformations and see how they contribute to the final work. With advice from the composer and the help of his archives, been able to trace the chronological stages of the evolution of the work. Our software enables us to show this evolution graphically. Each node in the graph is a sound that can be played. On another map, one can see for the sections we have been focusing on the evolution of the initial sound through its different processes up to the final mix. Processes leading to one particular note can then be further explored. So you can see how the whole piece was created out of the one, this one sound source that on the previous screen appeared just at the bottom there and see how it branched out into many different variations that were then put together to make the final version of the piece. And beyond that, as you just saw here, you can go and explore not all, we haven't had time to do that, but many of the techniques that were used to produce those transformations. So it really takes the reader into the composer's workshop, if you like, and shows them how this worked. And I should say this... Uh, example particularly has been much updated since the version you, you see here. Um, and in addition to that, this software, especially in that latest version, provides access to a vast resource of materials from the composer's archive that he's generously allowed us to use. And therefore, researchers can explore further than just our analysis. It's an example of our general aim that our analysis should not be end points, but starting points for others to carry on the research and the analysis. The next example shows an emulation of a now obsolete instrument called the Citer. It was used by the French composer Francis Daumont in another of our case studies, a piece called Phonogy. This emulation enables our readers to understand the transformational processes Daumont employed in this work in a way that purely verbal descriptions or mathematical formulae alone could never have done. By contrast with Truax and Wishart, the composer Francis Daumont does not produce his own software, but uses a variety of available systems as suits his purpose in a particular compositional situation. In composing Phonergy in 1998, he made substantial use of GRM's system, the CITER. This system is no longer extant and part of our work, with the help of GRM and the composer himself, has been to try to recreate both the functionality and the very distinctive user interface of this system. CITER allowed users to create presets, for example, specific settings for filters, place them in different positions on the screen, and then mediate between them using the cursor. Here is our emulation of this in operation. With all our case studies, our software is designed to enable our readers to gain a deeper understanding of the music by interacting with the sound itself and to understand more fully the role technical processes had in forming these works by experimenting with emulations of these techniques. The there is see on the screen there, there are circles, hopefully you can see sort of red, there are the, the balls, the, uh, uh, the presets, and then by moving the uh, cursor around, 
uh, you interpolate uh, between those. So we'll read as much as far as we can, uh, very close in fact to emulating the theory of the original hardware and software that was used in this piece. Finally, a more generic piece of software, which we've called Tiles, Tools for Interactive All Analysis. Sonograms have become quite common in music analysis recently, but printed on a page, I often feel they convey little musical information. They need to be heard, and more than that, I think they need to be interacted with in order to make them meaningful. Our interactive sonogram allows for this. The user can explore the sonogram in time and frequency to learn more about a sound or a texture. It can also be used as a tool for creating analytical charts that are not purely visual, but oral too. So a musical structure can be presented orally and not just verbally or visually. In addition to the nine applications dedicated to our case studies, we have been prototyping a generic software called Tyros that enables to study any electroacoustic work on the basis of an interactive sonogram. Unlike many sonograms which are purely graphical, with our interactive sonogram, the visual representation is directly linked to analysis data. So as you interact with the image on screen, you are also changing the sound itself, facilitating a deeper engagement with the music. Tiles is dedicated to the analysis of purely electroacoustic music. As a brief example, here is the interactive sonogram of the opening of Plans et Deliers from Bernard Parmigiani's De Natura Sonorum. Let us play a brief fragment. If we want, we can explore the sound by moving a band-limited cursor through the image to play just those frequencies that lie under the cursor. Now we can draw on the sonogram to select just a certain range of frequencies at particular times. And then we can play that selection, extracted from the overall sound. Here we have selected a large number of such sound objects, colored to represent different categories of events. These can then be placed in a palette, and from that palette can be used to create analytical charts. For example, here is a sketch of a simple paradigmatic chart. Again, there is a direct link between the visual and the oral. You can click on any of the items in the chart to hear it played. Tiles enables you to create as many charts as you may find useful for your analysis. So the software that we created for each of these nine case studies there will be uh, will be freely available online and the text in the book which we have a contract with Oxford University Press for Inside Computer Music will be directly linked with uh, videos as well to help people learn more about how the software operates and to hopefully entice those people who might not think they want to download software into seeing why they should download it and what it can offer. And so it will be a, a very closely integrated uh, package with software and videos and text. So I need to move back now to PowerPoint. So to move on now to um, IRIMAS and to introduce this new project, it's a five-year project with funding from the ERC uh, in the form of an advanced grant. And the idea is that it takes up where TACM left off. The difference is that IRIMAS looks beyond electroacoustic music to the whole repertoire of music. It also aims to develop generic tools, and the Tiles pr program you just saw there is a sort of prototype. Um, it was developed under the TACM project, actually, but wasn't really part of our specification for that project, but it acts as a, a, a kind of prototype uh, of the sort of thing that we're going to be doing in the new project. So developing generic tools for other researchers to use in their work. Uh, including, we hope, users who are not technically sophisticated. We're not just setting out, therefore, to create a number of analyses in this new project, but to create a framework for a new approach to analysis that can be made available to all musicologists. So I've already talked about the background to IRIMAS in the sense of how it grew out of interactive oral analysis. I'd like now to talk a little bit more about some of the uh, musicological context uh, for this. Attempts to integrate oral experience into musicological publications have been far and few between. In part, this is because until recently, the technology available to facilitate this has been limited. 
A notable early example is the work of Hans Keller, who died in 1985. His functional analyses, in fact, abandoned words altogether and were presented exclusively as musical performances. More recently, Karolina Barté, drawing on the ideas of Vladimir Yankelevich, has highlighted the ineffable in music, promoting the drastic as opposed to the Gnostic, the drastic involving a category of knowledge that flows from drastic actions or experiences and not from verbally mediated reasoning. Kofi Agawu has argued that in music analysis, the truth content is not necessarily a literal empirical truth, but rather a dynamic motivating truth. And that analysis is most productively understood and practiced as a mode of performance and as a mode of composition. I think we'd like to think some of the tools we're developing will hope that help that a mode of composition and performance as analysis to, to be available. He discusses the importance of the oral in analysis. The oral, aural home of music analysis has an effect on the kind of knowledge that is produced. Uh, oh, sorry, um, BT wants me to log on, so it's got in the way of PowerPoint. That's better. Um, another development in musicology has been a move towards significantly broadening the repertoire studied, going beyond the traditional boundaries of Western classical repertoire, enlarging what Georgina Bourne has described as what counts as music to be studied. Doing this often means embracing works that do not conform to the conventions of musical notation, of Western musical notation. With these musics, as with electroacoustic music, a fundamental question is where to begin if no score exists. Transcription, of course, is one solution, but this involves reductive interpretation and may not accurately reflect the complexity or the temporality of the music. A further movement in recent years has been towards research into music as performance. Nicholas Cook's groundbreaking monograph, Beyond the Score, Music as Performance, claims that it supplants the traditional musicological notion of music as writing and reconceives music as an activity through which music is produced in real time. Cook argues that scores represent pieces of music as spatial configurations, and music theory mainly consists of the elaboration of non-temporal models, whereas performance is an intrinsically temporal, real-time activity through which meanings emerge. All this implies that a major new breakthrough is urgently required, one that is, we hope, the key focus of IRIMAS, researching the full integration of musicological meaning with temporal and oral experience, and facilitating research where sound's dynamic aspects are fully represented. This is more than about simply changing the means of representation for research. Working in this way leads to a different approach to the research and to different research questions being posed and answered. On another level, such an approach also facilitates a change towards a more interactive, participatory model of research. Textual research tends to imply a model of direct transfer of pre-packaged knowledge to a recipient, whereas the creation of interactive software tools for a work or a repertoire implies a distributed model, one where recipient researchers participate in and in turn extend knowledge of the music. Although not working on the level of research, sorry, although this is working on the level of research rather than school education, there is perhaps something a little bit akin here to the constructionism developed by Seymour Papert at MIT. Flowing from all this, the overarching research questions for the IRIMAS project are how can the oral and temporal aspects of music become more fully integrated into musical research and its dissemination? How can an interactive oral approach enrich musicology through the development of new modes of musicological knowledge and seek to redress the biases of a textually oriented tradition? What software tools and algorithms need to be developed to facilitate this integration? And how can such tools be designed to enable non-technical musical researchers to work fluently with them? What are the implications of promoting a more participatory style of research and dissemination? Addressing these questions poses major challenges on the technical and the musicological levels, including the task of seeking to change a long established research culture. 
So what might these new modes of musical knowledge be? Musical motion is more than simply the sum of data from a sequence of static observation points. Journeying with the music, what the anthropologist Tim Ingold, in a rather different context, calls wayfaring, is important. This requires interactive oral experience, the acquiring of knowledge by actively engaging with and manipulating the sound in time, guided by dynamic visual representations and perhaps accompanied by a textual commentary. The integration of oral interaction is essential both for the acquisition and the dissemination of this temporal, transient knowledge. Charles Seeger wrote that the immediate aim of musicology is to integrate music knowledge and feeling in music and the speech knowledge and feeling about them to the extent that this is possible in speech representation. Whilst trying to indicate the extent to which this is not possible, this suggests a gap between knowledge about and knowledge of music and a need, as Tim Ingold has suggested, for knowing to be reconnected with being, epistemology with ontology, thought with life. By incorporating active engagement with sound, Irimas aims to expand musicological knowledge, thereby mitigating some of the limitations of relying purely on verbal knowledge or on statistical data derived from recordings. By combining live audio manipulations linked to dynamic visual, um, interac um, dynamic visual interactions with verbal commentaries and data, these forms of knowing can be integrated to produce new enhanced modes of musicolog musicological knowledge. For example, knowledge of timbre and amplitude evolving over time and how they combine with articulation, pitch fluctuations and rhythmic fluidity to shape a musical passage. The range of analytical questions becomes somewhat different when the research starts from the sound rather than the score. Such approaches are relevant to all musics, but perhaps have special significance for those musics which sit least comfortably with standard notational practices. For example, oral traditions in ethnomusicology, other non-Western traditions, improvisation, and contemporary art music, which often stretches traditional notational techniques. So Irimas will investigate these research questions in the context of a range of musics, focusing primarily on areas where notation and transcription are especially problematic, through case studies in ethnomusicology, contemporary music, and improvised music, but also looking at classical Western repertoire as it is performed. So one of our case studies will be in the area of ethnomusicology and with a particular emphasis on folk songs in performance. In the current state of the art, such repertoire, often an oral tradition, is usually transcribed into Western notation. But in performance, such music contains subtleties of timbral variation, microtonal pitch fluctuation, accent, flexibility of rhythm, tempo and dynamics, all of which can elude transcription. Furthermore, different performers sing and play in different ways, yet they may not be simply creating expressive departures from a fixed model, so much as flexibly realising the possibilities of both the song and the act of singing in particular social contexts. Using software to work directly with sound enables researchers to engage directly with the nuances of such music making and to compare it with the singing of others or with the same singer in a subsequent rendition. And again, without reducing the song to a notator transcription, which may not in any case capture the emphasis of the music. Let me play, for example, um, this extract from... Excuse me a moment. This example from uh, an African lullaby, um, which is quoted by Kofi Agarou in his recent book on uh, the musical imagination in African music. <laughs> Look at the car, 
Okela kakwa kwa woni nga uwanja la wo. So Kofi Aguru briefly analyzes this song in the book and he uses Western notation to outline it, as he says. Aguru himself discusses the limitation of transcription and in this case, both the pitch and rhythm structures are far more flexible and varied than can be notated and beyond what one might accept, uh, expect as simply expressive interpretation. Timbre, dynamics, rhythm and pitch are at times very fluid, contributing to distinctive, freely flowing melismatic patches passages, I should say. Interactive oral engagement with the sound using live dynamic visual representations will hopefully enable us to approach this sort of music and show how these fluid passages interact dynamically in the shaping of the music and how manipulating them can help us to understand their structure and their significance. Such an approach produces a very different account of the music from one centered around a reductive transcription into Western notation. Each of our case studies has a musicological expert leading it. In this case, it's Professor Jonathan Stock of University College Cork. And our advisory group also includes Professor Ingrid Monson of Harvard. Our second case study will focus on contemporary art music, in particular spectralism. This is music in which timbral aspects play a significant role in the conception, shaping and structuring of works. It has been to be found in music of composers such as Chelsea, Radulescu, Dufour, Griset, Murai, Haas, Harvey and Sariaho. Extended playing techniques often feature in this repertoire, further widening the sonic range. The internal structures of timbres, the way in which they are combined and transformations between timbres are central to how such works are formed. We will be looking primarily at acoustic music in this repertoire, but it has much in common with the computer music we were discussing earlier. Although this music is usually notated, crucially, notation does not fully represent the oral outcome of such works. Analysis of this music requires investigation at a level below that of the notated pitch and rhythm to consider spectral components and their transformation. Listen, for example, to this passage from Hugues Dufour's Burning Bright for six percussion players, written for Les Percussions de Strasbourg. The sonorities of the different percussion instruments combine to create different timbral content and a variety of textural qualities. The work is formed out of these timbres and textures evolving over time. The composer describes it as growing out of layers, breaking with the traditional conventions of demarcation, contours and closure. It is a music of continuity and transformation rather than of segments and rigid breaks. Uh, BT you want me to log in again? I'm sorry, it keeps uh, coming back. Ah, so. oh, sorry, I'm just going to have to um, close that in order for this to be allowed to take over the screen. So if that's a bit faint, uh, the video is on YouTube of the performance in two parts. So if you want to see it, uh, uh, I think the lighting is part of the performance. So that's why it's very dark. But you could see it uh, if you wanted to for yourself uh, a bit more clearly, perhaps. So software can help us to trace this evolving process, creating dynamic interactive representations linked to sound to enable an analysis based on continuously developing timbre and texture rather than on an assemblage of separate note events. The musicological expert for this case study uh, is uh, Professor Robert Adlington, a colleague at Huddersfield. 
and the advisory group also includes the composer, Professor Lisa Lim. So the next case study, the final case study, centers around improvisation, in particular tracking the creative process in free improvisation. By its very nature, this repertoire is not usually notated in full by the artists. Improvisation is flexible and fluid, and performance evolve over time through the interaction of the players. Notation and fixed graphics are too rigid and static to provide a full account of the subtleties and complex transformations happening over time. But software can link audio to dynamic interactive graphics and can transform sound uh, to help us focus on particular aspects and relationships. This case study will work with musicians to track the creative process as it develops. It will record rehearsals and performances, use software to analyze audio and video, to study the development of ideas across time between ensemble members. As Ingrid Monson has written, in relation to jazz improvisation, in rethinking analytical priorities for approaching the larger scale dimensions of jazz improvisation, I would like to suggest that we not be content with identifying structural shapes alone, we should be concerned as well with the interactive processes by which they emerge. This study will build on previous work that I have done with Professor Amanda Bailey, tracking the development of the creative process in a rather different context, that of Michael Finnis's Second String Quartet, where we use software to combine a range of ethnographic and analytical materials into an interactive resource. Amanda, who is now based at Bath Spa University, will lead this part of the project and our advisory group includes Professor Matt Wright from Canterbury Christchurch University, himself an improviser, and Professor Ingrid Monson once again. So I'm going to play now a video of um, the earlier work that I did with Amanda on Michael Finnis's Second String Quartet. Um, I forget the exact date, I think um, it's on there, isn't it? Uh, 2011. It was a first attempt at this use of software to uh, bring together a range of different materials. I, I thought some of the things in it um, resonated with some things that Roy was saying uh, this morning. And um, it was really, very, this is very much a first attempt at this, and I'd hope in our new project we'll be able to build on this sort of approach. That's all right. My name's Amanda Bailey and I'm Reader in Performing Arts at the University of Wolverhampton. Information resulting from composer-performer interactions, or even just performer interactions, typically remains undocumented. This research aims to develop a better understanding of musicians working together as a way of addressing the dichotomy between performance and musicology. The DVD is an outcome of my research with the Kreutzer Quartet and Michael Clark, who is Professor of Music at the University of Huddersfield. It aims to identify new procedures and methodologies for research into string quartet performance practice, to find original ways of presenting the findings to performers, composers and musicologists, and to explore new approaches to performance and analysis in ensemble playing.
One of the things you could see there was the interrelation between different works. Michael Finnis's second string quartet makes references to Haydn and also to Boulez, and so we were able to, able to interlink those through the software. So in addition to these three case studies in areas where music is often quite clearly exceeding the limitations of notation, we also intend to investigate more standard repertoire uh, using interactive oral techniques in the study of how this music is performed. Drawing on the work of those in the Charm Project and its successors, for example, Nick Cook, John Rink, Daniel Leach Wilkinson, Eric Clark, and others. How can our research be used to help further elucidate those crucial aspects of music that lie beyond the written score? For example, we believe our interactive approach can add significantly to the study of rubato, portamento, amplitude, and articulation in the performance of such repertoire. I should also mention that I, I mentioned a lot of the musicologists involved in this work. Um, uh, the team includes two postdocs, one of which is Frederic. Uh, we're also just advertising an advert now. We're advertising for three PhD students, uh, four years fully funded. There'll be musicologists working in each of those case studies. So if you know of people suitable, there's an ad on our website and also on Find a PhD and Things uh, with a closing date in January. Sorry for the, the advert break there. Uh, but the key thing I wanted to mention is that we're also working in collaboration with EARCAM. So Axel Röbel from EARCAM is uh, one of our team members and he'll be contributing together with our second postdoc uh, a lot of technical expertise to what we're doing. So in summary, IRIMA seeks to build on earlier work, applying the interactive oral approach to a broader repertoire, potentially of all musics, using the latest digital technology to enhance the existing text-based and visual-based approaches by incorporating the oral as a central element, developing tools for use by musicologists who are probably not, for the most part, technical experts, will be another key feature of our work. But none of this is to exclude other forms of digital musicology, which may well form important components of our work, even though they're not the primary focus. And as well as the oral, interaction is also central to our project in a number of different ways. Interaction with the sound itself through software, through analysis seen as creative engagement with the music, in emphasizing that the recipient of the analysis is not regarded as simply as a passive reader, but as someone facilitated to interact with the analytical materials presented and to extend and develop the analysis for themselves. The analytical output, therefore, not as a finished end product, but as an invitation to continuing imaginative exploration. And I've just got here, if I go back to the PowerPoint, um, Those are, are the websites uh, for the interactive oral analysis work I've told you about, uh, for the TACEM project, um, which I've played the video examples from, and then the new project, it's a very new website, there's not a lot of materials there, but there are the adverts I was telling you about for the PhD studentships. Um, so they're all essentially the same URL with uh, a different ending, uh, if you want to look up any of those. And then uh, that's the bibliography for the quotes that I gave. So, thank you very much.
you support the migration of uh, these digital tools for yeah. the future? Yeah. Because it's, a it's an important, very important question. It's a big one. It's one we certainly thought of. All the software that you've seen there, um, yeah, every piece of software you saw, apart from the demand of AI, the utility of that, the rest of it was developed by Treasury. Uh, it was all developed in the Max program, Max MSP as it used to be called. Um, we are um, intending to look again at the new project and whether that is the best platform. It's enabled us to do a lot of work very quickly. If we had to start from programming C or something, it would have been a much bigger job. On the other hand, uh, with any commercial piece of software, there are potential concerns for the very long term. Um, uh, so it's, it's going to be important to issue for us to address and what we've already started to address in the new project, though we haven't come to any final solutions yet. I should say one good thing about having a second project or third project following on from the earlier one is that the team is still together and so it makes it easier for us over the next five years at least to continue to maintain and develop things. Uh, I should say that software, some of the software I was talking about there was developed that I've worked on 10, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, some of it, and I don't think any of it is not functioning now. But obviously, potentially in the future, there are issues. So we do want to address that and think about longevity as best we can, especially what you program in, but at the same time, how you can program quickly and make progress rather than spend months reinventing the wheel of the basics before you get onto new things. Um, at the same time, um, uh, we do want things to last and survive. So, a very good question, thank you. Uh, no immediate quick solution there. I should say that, um, uh, sorry, you probably all noticed in the program at the end. The, the final segment of the, um, the afternoon will be the, uh, be an open discussion um, with, with, with everybody joining in, I hope. So, so there should be opportunities to talk, uh, to ask some further questions. Um, Nick, you want to get down? Who's there for any more technical questions? Fred Reed here at the front is the person to ask. I think that's the best programming these days, and Fred Reed has done a, a massive job in uh, developing the technology further for, for that latest project.